Tonight, on the eve of a hike in the federal carbon tax, Manitoba says it's looking at a plan of its own. We're going to hit net zero without a consumer facing a carbon tax. Why economists worry that other options may not cost less. <laughs> Offering community on Easter Sunday. Young people reaching out to isolated seniors. Do you know they say, if your kids move away from you, it's because you brought them up right, because they don't need you. But it's hard. It's really hard. A successful Canadian grocer plans a southern invasion. Gosh, man. I hope we succeed. But I'm humble about it. It's a different country. It's going to be hard. My conversation with TNT CEO, Tina Lee. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. The federal government's next carbon price hike is just hours away. Starting Monday, the price of gasoline and natural gas will go up in most provinces. To offset that, residents will get bigger rebates. The tax goes up every year, but the pushback this time has also increased. Many Canadians are feeling financially squeezed. The official opposition has criticized it heavily. And many premiers have been lobbying Ottawa to halt the hike. This only affects provinces and territories that don't have their own carbon pricing plans, which is most of them. Marina von Stackelberg shows us why Manitoba hopes it won't be in that group much longer. Filling up at the gas pump will soon cost many Canadians an extra three cents per litre. Home heating will be more pricey too. This year's federal carbon tax hike comes after months of pressure on the Liberal government, especially from premiers who say cash-strapped Canadians can't afford it. Now Manitoba's premier is making the case for an exemption. Manitoba has a really strong case to make that we're going to hit net zero without a consumer facing a uh, carbon tax. BC and Quebec are already exempt because they brought in their own carbon pricing programs that meet or exceed the federal carbon tax. Manitoba plans to present Ottawa with its own plan, which Wab Canoe says can meet the bar in part because of hydropower. We have effectively decarbonized our electricity in Manitoba, and that's true today. Canada's Deputy Prime Minister says Ottawa is all ears. Where provinces and territories are interested in and are prepared to come forward with their own provincial or territorial plans to put a price on pollution, um, we are very, very keen to work with them. Who's ready to axe the tax? It comes as federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev rallied against the tax this week in Winnipeg and met with Premier Canoe. As for uh, his, the Premier's view on the April Fool's Day Trudeau tax hike, uh, he, he can speak for himself, he's uh, more than capable and I'm happy to work with him and anyone uh, to uh, bring home lower prices for Canadians. But more than 300 economists signed a letter this week supporting the carbon tax, arguing that it does not contribute to inflation, despite what opponents say. Any alternative that they're likely to suggest is going to be more expensive or more damaging for the economy than the carbon price. And Marina Ottawa says the, the tax hike is only half the story. Yeah, Ottawa offsets the tax by sending Canadians rebate checks. Those will also increase tomorrow. The federal government says 80% of households get more money back than they pay out. Now, the purpose of the carbon tax is to fight climate change by encouraging people and businesses to switch to cleaner energy sources. And Ottawa argues it's working. Early modeling from the Canadian Climate Institute shows since the carbon tax was brought in in 2019, the country's overall greenhouse gas emissions are down more than 5%. All right. Thank you, Marina. A Montreal couple is speaking out after receiving an urgent safety recall on their truck. The defect could lead to a sudden loss of power and a crash. But for nearly two years, the car maker had no permanent fix, and the truck sat in a dealer's lot waiting for repairs. Here's Rosa Marcatelli with tonight's Go Public Investigation. The fuel starvation may result in an unexpected loss of motive power, which can cause a vehicle to crash. Michelle Ashenden got that urgent recall notice for their 2016 Dodge Ram 1500 way back in June 2022. We never thought in a million years we'd be waiting this long. Her husband, Vittorio Polcini, says the truck was too dangerous to drive. It will just randomly shut off while driving, like 100% completely black. The couple towed the truck to their local dealership and waited and waited 
racking up thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs for rental vehicles and more. Well, I'm here at... Ashenden documented the weight and the deteriorating condition of the truck. been sitting here for an entire year, almost, and there's no word of anything. According to Transport Canada, up to one in five vehicles has an unresolved safety recall. It's not clear how many of those are because automakers don't have a fix. An expert blames a hole in Transport Canada rules that allows automakers to take as long as they want to complete recalls. Transport Canada should be able to hold the manufacturer accountable. There should be consequences. Transport Canada says each recall problem and the timeline for its solution are unique, so manufacturers must control the process to ensure vehicle safety. Stellantis manufactures and sells Ram trucks. It says recalls cannot be rushed, adding this particular one needed redesigned fuel system components that required engineering validation and more. At first, the automaker said it won't be compensating the couple for their out-of-pocket costs, saying they'd turned down an offer for a temporary fix that would have kept the truck on the road. It's not clear who said what when it comes to that offer. But after Go Public sent the automaker emails showing the dealership never delivered on it, things changed. Solantis now says it's looking at reimbursement. Money out of pocket, uh, you know, mistreated. A permanent fix became available a month ago, too late for the couple. They traded the truck in at a different dealership. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Some Tim Hortons franchisees in Quebec are taking the brand's owner, TDL Group, to court, claiming their profits are suffering because of constraints imposed by TDL. The franchisees say the company controls everything from deals with suppliers to the prices of ingredients and sets the prices of menu items. They say that leaves them with no room to maneuver and has hurt profits. Tim Hortons rejects the claims which haven't been tested in court. And major U.S. telecom AT&T says it's notifying tens of millions of customers about a data breach after their information, including social security numbers, showed up for sale on the dark web. It says it's not sure where the breach occurred and that the data is from 2019 or earlier. Despite a national shortage of housing, according to the latest numbers from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, new home construction has been flat for the past three years. But last year, those that were built included a record number of rental units, a response in part to a historically low vacancy rate and sky-high rents. But new apartments take years to finish, and the shortage is hitting Canadians right now. Our next two stories show how widespread the impacts can be. For those struggling to find shelter, Toronto's rooming houses may be relatively affordable, but they're largely operated on the margins, lightly regulated, sometimes dangerous. Jamie Strachan has the city's latest move to change that. Desperation pushed Beely so into Toronto's world of unregulated rooming houses, cheap accommodations in houses chopped into small rooms. I couldn't find an affordable place to move. With few other options, she has dealt with flooding, mold and landlords who had little regard for rules. I mean, for low-income people, the only you know, place you can afford is rooming house again, right? And that's where I live. For years, rooming houses existed in the shadows. Illegal and unlicensed, the exact number unknown, only coming to light when disaster struck. The city says since 2011, 14 people have died in rooming house fires. And when they're illegal, uh, we don't know where they are. We don't know if they meet the fire code. We don't know if the tenants are being treated well. New areas will expand the rules where rooming houses, up to six units, can be built, but will come with conditions. Owners will be subject to inspections, must have a property maintenance plan, and will need a process for tenants to request services. Similar rules are in place in Halifax and Vancouver. In Toronto, advocates hope it will encourage more desperately needed affordable units and make them safer. Right now, the existing rooming houses are the most affordable housing available for single people. So that's students, that's newcomers, um, that's uh, uh, people, seniors, uh, people who just have low incomes. <laughs> this has been the place for them. Convincing existing owners to register their buildings will be a challenge. The city says it will help bring them up to code. 
I think we're going to get better outcomes for tenants. We're going to get better outcomes for, for adjacent neighbours. Um, but it's not going to be easy. For tenants like B. Lee So, it's a chance at safety and dignity after so many years in the shadows. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. The rental squeeze in Halifax is among the worst in the country. Finding an apartment hard for anyone, but as Nicholas Sagan shows us, some parents say they face an added challenge. Landlords who don't want kids. I like Margaret because she kind of likes it better. Mallory Gunn has been scrambling for nearly a year to find a home. I begged, plead, I've cried, I've told my story about you know how I'm going to be homeless if I don't find a place, um, just to give me a chance. She's been staying with her ex-partner as dozens of landlords turn her down, some saying they fear her kids would bring noise and damage. I prayed every night to find a place for me and my children. <laughs> Halifax has some of the fastest growing rents and lowest vacancy rates in Canada, making every affordable unit precious. The Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission says it's illegal to refuse to rent to tenants because of their children and it urges people to report this type of abuse. And we thought, you know, if, if, we, don't, if we don't make the fight, then, then nobody's going to. This family says a landlord told them of a no-child policy when they were searching for a rental in 2019. They did file a human rights complaint, and an officer spoke to the landlord who admitted to the policy. But that got them nowhere. We had that problem, and we did contact them, and... They basically ignored us for two years, and then at the end of the two years just went, no. The Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission declined an interview, but its own numbers show the average complaint takes more than two years to complete. And other provinces have similar backlogs, meaning some people just don't report. It's very difficult for tenants to access uh, effective justice when there's so, such long delays. I had to focus on getting a place. I just didn't have time. I have two kids. And deep down inside, like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this complaint. Like, what's really going to happen? Is it, like, is someone going to listen to me? Just as she was losing hope, Gunn did find a place to live. Good job, babe. Still, she hopes there can be meaningful change so other parents don't have to go through the same thing. Nicholas Sagan, CBC News, Halifax. Turning overseas now, a car bomb exploded in a busy market in northern Syria, killing at least three people and wounding dozens. First responders pushing through frantic crowds as they searched for survivors and picked through the wreckage. The area is under the control of Turkish-backed militants. There were no immediate claims of responsibility. Now to the ongoing cleanup in Baltimore at the scene of that catastrophic bridge collapse. Salvage crews are using massive cranes to remove debris from the river. As Katie Simpson shows us, this is just the beginning of what will be painstaking work. Each cut has to be meticulously planned. A careful feat of engineering to shear off pieces of twisted metal debris into smaller, more manageable chunks that can be hauled away by cranes and barges. It's a slow-moving, dangerous operation, and there's still no best guess yet on when the cleanup is going to be complete. This is going to be a very complex process. There are even now forces acting on that steel, so it takes a lot to make sure that it can be dismantled safely. The short-term goal for now is to clear out one specific area of the wreckage site, with engineers zeroing in on the north end of the bridge. This will eventually allow us to open up a temporary restricted channel that will help us to get more vessels in the water around the site of the collapse. As all of this is taking place, the crew of the Dolly cargo ship remains on board. The vessel is running on generator power and the living and eating quarters were not damaged. They're also reportedly cooperating with investigators who are still trying to determine exactly why the ship lost power, setting out on its fatal collision course. The conditions are still too difficult to resume the recovery mission for the missing victims, the four remaining construction workers presumed dead. It's been days now since divers have been able to search. They've scanned all the safe areas outside the bridge debris and as close to and inside the bridge debris as they can. Uh, they just don't feel it's safe anymore because the places they need to go, they can't get to. With the cleanup ramping up, meetings are planned for the week ahead to get emergency aid to local businesses and the thousands of dock workers who remain in limbo for the foreseeable future. 
Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Niagara Falls has taken the unusual step of declaring a state of emergency ahead of next month's solar eclipse. The region is expecting more than a million tourists on April 8th. The precautionary measure will help officials brace for large crowds which could overwhelm traffic, emergency services and cell phone networks. On a day when many of you have been celebrating a visit from the Easter Bunny, some friendly advice from animal advocates in British Columbia. Don't get a pet rabbit unless you're planning to keep it. So many of them have been released across Metro Vancouver. It's led to problems for communities and for the animals themselves. Georgie Smythe has the story. In this case, it seems the difference between a pet and a pest is time. At some point, rabbits were left here. And bunny math means with time, one plus one can equal hundreds. The odd rabbit here and there takes a while. But when you're abandoning a lot in one place, you can have an explosive colony pretty quickly. These are all rabbit homes here. For years, the city has discouraged people from feeding and abandoning rabbits in Vancouver's parks. But its animal shelters are overrun and no longer accepting surrenders. Advocates say some feel it's more humane to let them go in places like this than have them euthanized. Now they're expecting a springtime bunny boom. It's sad, um, like they are domestic rabbits, so ultimately they don't belong outdoors. Oh my God, it's lunchtime. Some are rescued and end up in outreach places like this bunny cafe, where people pay to feed, cuddle and maybe adopt. I think my bunny would like a friend, but I have it in my room, so I don't really want two bunnies in my room. But they can't be rehomed fast enough, and the supply of bunnies in the great outdoors just keeps coming. We can all see that the existing patchwork of municipal approaches is not working to curb this problem. Often provinces regulate the breeding of dogs, for instance, for very good reason. But we also need to start to regulate the breeding of rabbits as well as the sale of rabbits. Sterilization is also one way to fix this rabbit growth, but it needs buy-in fast. Without intervention, the problem will just keep multiplying. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. Volunteers in Quebec are helping isolated seniors enjoy their Easter. It feels very reassuring that you're not alone. The powerful impact in Montreal and the plans to expand further next. Plus Canada's festival scene under threat of failure. I've never seen such a situation. Why so many shows cannot go on. And an Easter egg hunt with an aerial twist. We're back in two. Tens of thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square to mark Easter Sunday. Pope Francis led a mass just days after health concerns caused him to miss a Good Friday procession. In a public address, Francis called for a ceasefire in Gaza and the return of Israeli hostages. He also called for a prisoner swap between Russia and Ukraine. Wow, You're very brave to stand out here. <laughs> And King Charles attended an Easter service at Windsor Castle, his first major public outing since his diagnosis with an unspecified form of cancer. Neither Prince William nor his wife, Catherine, was in attendance. Just over a week ago, she made public that she had started preventative chemotherapy. For many people, this holiday weekend is a time for families to get together, but for many seniors living alone, it can add longing to their isolation. Kubina Duro looks at how one Quebec group is trying to change that. I can certainly eat the sugar pie. For Easter weekend this year, Diane Lewis is sharing a meal with some new faces. Her children are spread out all over the globe, from Tennessee to Sweden, making Easter weekend emotional. Lonely, sad. But you know, they say, if your kids move away from you, it's because you brought them up right, because they don't need you. But it's hard. The 82-year-old says those feelings reached new heights during the pandemic, so she decided to take action. Reaching out to Little Brothers, a group that provides support to seniors age 75 and older across Quebec. I love it. It's warm. It's supportive. 
it feels very reassuring that you're not alone, you know, that there's somebody there. According to Statistics Canada, about one in five Canadian seniors aged 65 and older reported experiencing loneliness in 2019 and 2020. Last November, the World Health Organization declared loneliness a global public health concern. I think a lot of older people are connected to social media and to I think people are, are, many people, older people are a little bit poorer than they were too. And things are a little bit more expensive, so there's less money to spend on things. If you smile. This volunteer says with more people feeling lonely, holiday brunches are more important than ever. It reminds them that, um, that they still matter to someone, that they're not forgotten, that uh, you know, people want, to, want their company, want them to share in, in a festive meal. For 83-year-old Janet Broxup, it's more than a meal. Her children also live in different countries. It looks like a small group, but it's really a community, a family. It's very nice. I love it. <laughs> Little Brothers is hoping to expand its services across Canada, so more seniors will be able to be part of the family. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. Several festivals are being forced to shut down across Canada and there's concern about a potential domino effect. If those stops are missing on either side of Winnipeg, it means we miss out as well. How the failure of one event could hurt others. Plus, an Asian supermarket founded in Canada with international ambitions. We think we have something special. My conversation with TNT CEO, Tina Lee and why car thieves in Canada are dialed in on the suburbs. The penalty for stealing a vehicle in the province of Ontario is like... The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Canada's Zach Eady sends Purdue to its first NCAA Final Four since 1980. The Toronto-born superstar scoring 40 points to take down Tennessee 72-66. His team now one step closer to the men's basketball championship. They face NC State on Saturday. Spring and summer are usually prime time for Canadian festivals, but post-pandemic, many are struggling to stay afloat. Eli Glasner explains why and how some are finding solutions. Launch day at Hot Dogs, a critical day for filmmakers. When a film premieres here, it makes news. Um, it is really important for the life of the film, but also for the life of our communities. But now many are wondering if Hot Dogs, like so many festivals hit hard by the pandemic, can survive. That has left organizations like Hot Dogs really teetering. It's far from alone. From Montreal to Vancouver, major arts festivals are closing doors and hitting pause. I've never seen such a situation. The culprit? Many point to inflation. We estimate that it costs uh, festivals and events 30 to 40 percent more to organize an event this year compared to 2019. And so that's a huge problem because the revenues didn't follow the same trend. In Montreal, they're preparing for a summer without Just for Laughs, the comedy festival that added $34 million to Quebec's economy. But some effects can't be quantified. In Winnipeg, the start of folk festival is the first sign of summer. You can just see the tension leaving people's shoulders as the first day they're coming from straight from work and they just, they just relax. But even successful events can be affected when others go under. It prevents the block booking that across Canada where, where bands can go from city to city to city. And if those, if those stops are missing on either side of Winnipeg, it means we miss out as well. Last season, the Stratford Festival posted a profit with an aggressive outreach campaign. We're seeing lots of new people come to us. Uh, about 30% of the audience were new to the festival. While most festivals are supported by public funding, many say it's stuck in the past. If I talk about uh, heritage, Canadian heritage, uh, we, we live on the same budget basis as back in 2008. Organizers say investing in the arts makes good business sense. But audiences have a role to play, showing their support while they can. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. When car thieves target suburbs, technical tricks help them get away. It was like I'm dreaming. No, they live somewhere. 
But first, Canada's largest Asian supermarket chain heads to the U.S. How big a risk is that? It depends on who you ask. Founder Cindy Lee imagined a one-stop store for her cooking. You go mother founder to daughter successor. Then they join forces with a grocery titan. I'm not saying Loblaw hasn't made mistakes in the past. I met up with CEO Tina Lee at a TNT store in Coquitlam. One of the things that we like to do is focus on, on stories of Canadian excellence. And I think TNT certainly fits the bill. But for someone who's never been in yeah. one of your supermarkets, how would you describe it to them? Uh, I, I describe it as a really amazing specialty store with great fresh produce and seafood and bakery cakes that you die for. <laughs> so what's interesting is you didn't use the word Asian at all oh, in describing did I the not? supermarket. Definitely is Asian. Yeah, so I, yes, we are an Asian grocery store, or I'd also like to say a specialty tea store with an Asian flair. Because what I think has like, evolved over time is that um, we're not just an Asian grocer for Asian people, we're a specialty store that everyone enjoys to shop. What about the city of Vancouver, particularly in the 90s, this Canadian city perched on the Pacific, very much with a connection to Asia? Mm -hmm. We would not have been as successful had it not been Vancouver and Richmond and this environment that allowed us to start a business and grow this business that was a celebration of food and culture. And that is acceptable in our society. That is Vancouver. Like Vancouver is known as the gateway to Asia. So TNT is building, it's building across Canada. And then Loblaw, the big supermarket chain, is interested in, in acquiring TNT. Yes. What did that mean for your mom? What did that mean for the company? It was the early start of that conversation. Um, it was a real surprise to us. And we got to meet uh, Mr. Weston, senior and Galen Weston himself and our stories were quite similar and they showed admiration for what we were doing and we were flattered by it. So we still uh, manage the business today, we're still shareholders in the business today and they have been an incredible part of the reason why we're able to accelerate our growth and um, they have great respect. They're like, Tina, Cindy, we want you to stay. We want your management to team to stay. And uh, we want to help you reach more Canadians. Now, you know, some people, as they hear you speak so warmly about Loblaw, blah, blah, yeah. might be kind of yelling at their TV and saying, I know. We don't like Loblaw. Blah, I know. And we don't like their prices. What do you say to those people? Yeah, I honestly, it hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, I feel like Loblaw blah is the most misunderstood business. And look, I am not at, in that building that much. I operate separately, TNT, from Loblaws, but the times that I have had a chance to interact with him and um, uh, how much Lobla has supported TNT growth, I admire that. I do feel warmly about that. Us as an industry, Lobla happens to be the biggest, us as an industry, happens to be taking it on the chin right now. There's no doubt, life is hard right now. Certainly food is a part of it. But some I... people would say predatory pricing by grocery chains. Is that true? Is and that happening? No. So look, there are a thousand and one things that can go wrong in a grocery store. A thousand and one things. My mother likes to remind me all the time, okay? And I'm sure that in this banner, on that street, it did occur at some point. I'm not saying Loblaw hasn't made mistakes in the past. I have made mistakes in the past too. I just think people need to understand that that is not the intent. It is not the intent. If you look at the profit model of a grocery store, uh, there is, like, we sort of whittle down to 4% profit. If people were so mad about it and we all became charities at the end of the day, how much would you spend, save on your grocery bill? Like, 4%. 
is that going to move the dial? Like, you know, I'm not sure, right? But by the way, this is how I feel, and it's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Canada is actually a very competitive grocery market. There's a lot of different choices you have, and if you don't like the pricing of that particular store, then go to vote with your feet and your wallet and go down the street into another store. I feel good when my staff can say, yeah, I feel great value for money and I'm shopping all my groceries uh, here. I'm not shopping around anymore. So we have covered all the different income levels and I aspire to this for my customers too, which is whatever your income level, you can walk the entire store of TNT and you can shop with dignity. Let's talk about your meeting here earlier this morning. It, it was fascinating for us to watch. Okay. Um, so I'll mention a few things that, that, that I noticed and you tell me what it says about where TNT is Yeah, right now. sure, what did you notice? Well, first of all, it started with a staff member singing beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how many <laughs> weekly meetings start like that. Why, why do you do that? Uh, so, um, well, our, the meeting, it's called a huddle, it's our weekly huddle. It starts at nine o'clock at 8.57. Uh, we used to play a song over the overhead to say, hey guys, it's time to come, the huddle's gonna start soon, and a lot of us like karaoke around here. Shocking. <laughs> Are you surprised? Like, <laughs> can I stereotype that a lot of us likes uh, karaoke around here? We're also um, um, a really interesting place to work in that way, where um, you can use the language that you're comfortable in. If you're comfortable speaking Mandarin, then speak Mandarin. Actually, you didn't hear Cantonese today, but Cantonese is also commonly heard in this building. Um, English is commonly heard in this building, and for the most part, you know, everybody understands what's going on. And like, that's rare, right? That's that's rare at a, at, at corporate in a, in a corporate setting. It's pretty amazing to be a new immigrant to Canada, and then to be able to have the chance to operate in your own language and um, you can really be the best that you can be when you're not trying to translate stuff that's happening in your mind. If we did this interview 25 years ago, the headline would be, young woman of Asian descent is CEO of a supermarket chain. In 2024, is that still a factor? Is that still an issue for you? I don't think this role was meant for me. I think it's kind of funny that the third kid we had another kid in our family because my dad really wanted a boy. <laughs> and it is somewhat traditional uh, in family businesses for heirs to be males, like that, you know. I can agree with you that 25 years ago that it is rare for a successor to be a daughter. In fact, what is even more rare is that this is a matriarch story. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't think of many other matriarch stories where you go mother founder to daughter successor. And by the way, we're a minority story. Like, that's pretty crazy. It never occurred to my, my parents before, like, you know, they didn't judge whether I could do the job or not do the job uh, because I'm a uh, female. Like, it was not a thing close, but I think it is a, a unique thing culturally and also that we are outside of Asia, that we are here in Canada. That is, that is unique. Your chain is doing something which is challenging, yeah, exciting, I assume, opening up a store in the United States. I know. Do you think it's a bad idea? <laughs> it's a big idea. It's a big idea. So Seattle, Washington. That's right. How big a risk is that? It depends on who you ask. And let me tell you the real story. Every American long weekend, we see a huge inflow of new customers and new faces. And about, you could go into the parking lot and about like one in 10 cars in the parking lot have American plates. We've done enough market research. We think we have something special. 
we're going to do our best to make sure that we're going to bring Canadians pride, that um, customers in Bellevue are going to love what we do, and try to mitigate all those risks to make sure we don't have empty shelves. Like that's like my nightmare. That would be my nightmare. Um, but it's a worthy journey. You want to make Canadians proud by succeeding in the United States. Let me finish with this. How does your mother feel about this pivotal moment for the company? <laughs> I brought it up to my mother in like 2012, and she's like, there's totally something there, but that's your chapter. <laughs> that's on you. That's on you, girl. You go get that. Uh, but no, but I, I'll, 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 I'll be cheering you on from the sidelines. <laughs> Gosh, man, I hope we succeed, but I'm humble about it. It's a different country. It's going to be hard. You know, let it not be the next time we're together, three years from now, and we're having the same interview like, okay, Tina, let's talk about what went wrong. <laughs> you know, this is going to be a great Canadian lesson of what went wrong and how not to do business in the U.S. You know, like, let not that be, and we're going to be together again three years from now saying, wow, this is a great Canadian company that made it across the border. But it would be pretty cool if something born in Richmond, B.C. became something that we could export to other countries. I look forward to our next interview, which I understand is in three years from now. Yeah, I know. Let's do this again. All right. That border between British Columbia and Washington State, you know, is just a, a short drive from where we are right now, but it can be huge for retailers. Target discovered it the other way around when they had empty shelves in Canada when they tried expanding up here. So TNT is, uh, you know, as we heard, they have their fingers crossed about their expansion. Car thieves are targeting Canada's suburbs and navigating around added security measures. A lot of these groups are using signal jammers. What could be done to curb the mounting crisis? White car thieves love to target the suburbs. Been looking at a doubling year over year. And it's not just their victims who pay the cost. If all the thefts are happening this year, it'll translate into premiums next year. Robin Miller went to the Ottawa suburb of Barhaven to break down all the ways this growing crime wave causes people harm. At this point, everybody knows somebody. It's not safe for me and my kids. The penalty for stealing a vehicle in the province of Ontario is like... This is probably the most talked about issue in the insurance industry. At the end of the day, how do you stop it? So we know automobile theft is a problem across the country. It's a crisis and it's been in the news a lot lately with police, manufacturers, politicians and other industry leaders all stepping in to stop it. But we wanted to know why it's happening in small, sleepy suburbs. So Ryan, who's a producer here, and I are headed to Barhaven. Okay, so we're on our way now. We're headed to meet Detective Doug Boulanger. He's been working the auto theft beat for the last six years. When I started in 2018, we were looking at a rate of about 70 vehicles, like targeted vehicle thefts for uh, enterprise crime. And basically every year from that point on, we, we've been looking at a doubling year over year. That adds up to at least 1,800 vehicle thefts last year alone. So why are they doing it? The profitability behind it all makes it a really a no-brainer to continue doing. And where are they doing it? Well in suburbs, like this one. I think that's, it's largely due to uh, proximity to the highway and the getaway to Montreal, which is where the vast majority of these vehicles go. So we know thefts are on the rise and we know neighborhoods like this one are being targeted, but we wanted to know how people who live here feel about it. So let's go knock on some doors. The first thing we noticed is that we were on camera a lot. Have you heard about car thefts happening in this area? Yeah, we had a lot of issues. My neighbor next door, a friend of mine down here, yeah, uh, they all had their car stolen. How do you protect your car? Uh, one of them is the camera right there. They're actually not protecting anything. A lot of these groups are using signal jammers. A lot of the times those systems are cutting out during the actual theft. So if we look at the video after the facts, we see the car, we see a black spot, and then we see the taillights leaving the driveway. That might be what happened here. This woman's Jeep was stolen right out of the driveway. 
Nothing was caught on camera. It was like I'm dreaming. No, the Jeep is somewhere. My daughter, maybe she parked it somewhere else. Then, yes, we found out it was stolen. Police managed to track the Jeep down at the port of Montreal. And now it's safely tucked inside her garage when it's not on the road. And that's not the only precaution she's taking. Also, we purchase uh, like the wheel drive stick. So wherever we're stopping it, we have to put it and even inside my garage. And they have the second car. It should also always um, blocking the way of the Jeep and always try to keep the fob also away. That's important because sometimes thieves use signal amplification to trick a car into thinking the key is nearby. Other times, they order blank keys off the internet and program them to start the car. How are you? Good, how are you doing? At this point, everybody knows somebody. Uh, it's, it's, it's been, um, they've been pretty aggressive, I'll call it. We've had about five or six of our neighbors down the same street that have had uh, their uh, cars stolen, and mine as well. In Haitham Atiyat's case, the thieves smashed his sunroof. They weren't able to drive away because his Jeep was standard. It cost a lot. How much are we talking? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm at 15000 Here's a look at the most stolen vehicles across the country, a list insurance companies know well. We went to visit an insurance broker to check out the impact. Uh, we're seeing quite a few premiums go up. We're also seeing restrictions placed on insureds because of high-risk vehicles. Insurance rates are based on history. So if all the thefts are happening this year, it'll translate into premiums next year. I don't think you can make, you can keep everyone happy. Like there's just, it's not possible. So people are losing vehicles. They're out a lot of money, but some industry experts say that's not the biggest impact of these crimes and that people need to stop looking at these thefts as just property crimes. It's funding drugs, it's funding human trafficking, it's funding firearms. Uh, and these aren't just the vehicles that are being exported. These crimes are staying within the, in the communities in which we all live. People here say they're tired of living on high alert. In fact, some people we spoke to didn't even want us to shoot their homes or their vehicles because they were worried that they'd become a target. Police say they're doing all they can, but that policing isn't the only solution. Some say manufacturers need to step up. Others say legislation needs to change because there's a lot of money to be made here and the thieves aren't slowing down. The Insurance Bureau of Canada says private auto insurers paid out $1.2 billion in theft claims in 2022. That's three times more than just four years earlier in 2018. Coming up, an Easter egg hunt kicked up a notch. We thought, you know, let's go big and let's, let's dump 25,000 eggs out of a helicopter. The high-flying twist next in our moment. Well, this is a helicopter taking part in a special Easter mission in LaSalle, Ontario this weekend. The goal, carry this year's Easter egg hunt to new heights. In total, 25,000 eggs came raining down from the sky while hundreds of children watched in anticipation. And tonight, that exciting moment for the community is our moment. The Easter Bunny was there as the star of the show, and the helicopter, of course, was the second star of the show. And we thought, you know, let's go big, and let's let's dump 25,000 eggs out of a helicopter. The morning started at, at 10 a.m. with registration, and we had 800 children and families register. The kids were so excited to see the helicopter and then to see the Easter Bunny and to, of course, grab all the eggs that they could. Uh, one little kid told me that he was going to get 100 eggs. And once those eggs came out of the helicopter, it was the oohs and the ahs from the little kids that just made the morning worth it. And the kids then would run out, and within 10 minutes, the eggs were all collected. And then after they were collected, then they went and they redeemed their bag of eggs for a big chocolate Easter bunny and some other activity books and things. Um, so it really was a, a fantastic family event. As you would expect, uh, organizers have a safety plan. Those are empty, like, toy eggs that are dropped uh, far away from the crowd, so it is safe. Still, those of us of a certain age see that, and we think Les Nessman, Thanksgiving, turkeys. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app 
and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. Good night.